Hare Krishna Maharaj. How are you, Maharaj? Yes, I'm okay, Prabhu. Thank you. I hope. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, we can begin. Uh, just two minutes, Maharaj. I will uh, just I'll, uh, say a few words, then we can start. Uh, Hare Krishna devotees, uh, uh, welcome to this uh, uh, class of Bhakti on the level of Bhakti Vai Bhava, uh, Module 1, Unit 6, which you will be studying uh, Second Canto, Chapter 1 to 5. There are five classes, which is uh, happens every Tuesday and Thursday. And uh, first of all, congratulations for joining this course. And uh, you are all fortunate, we are all fortunate because to teach this unit, we have with us His Holiness Vignaminashikana uh, Shim Swami Maharaj. You know Maharaj, he needs no introduction, but for our purification, just I'll say a few words. Maharaj joined the uh, uh, movement in 1971 and he got initiated uh, by His Divine Grace, H.C. Bhakti Vedanta Shila Prabhupada in London. The next year, he got a second initiation, Maharaj preaching extensively to all his countries. Later on, Maharaj took uh, Sanyasa Diksha from his own name is Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. And uh, Maharaj is the personification of the verse, uh, Trinada Pisuni Jaina. Maharaj is so humble, you know, you will uh, realize when as the clock progresses. And um, you know, Maharaj is. Uh, uh, you know, great contributor to our Mayapur Institute and Maharaj, you know, teaches in all the levels like Bhakti Shatri, Bhakti Vaibhava and even Bhakti Vedanta. So we are fortunate to have with him and uh, so these devotees take, make use of, of Maharaj. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Over to you. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shremati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sunyavadi Paschatyadesha Tarine Vanchakopa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so, uh, let's
Okay, so welcome everyone to our Bhakti Vai Bhav. Here you can see we're covering the second canto. <coughs> this is something a, a bit out of the out of line with what we're studying, but I thought it would be nice for us to hear something from Srimad Bhagavatam. This is from the song by Lord Shiva. My dear Lord, your two lotus feet are so beautiful that they appear like two blossoming petals of the lotus flower, which grows during the autumn season. Indeed, the nails of your lotus feet emanate such a great effulgence that they immediately dissipate all the darkness in the heart of a conditioned soul. My dear Lord, kindly show me that form of yours which always dissipates all kinds of darkness in the heart of a devotee. My dear Lord, you are the supreme spiritual master of everyone. Therefore, all conditioned souls covered with the darkness of ignorance can be enlightened by you as the spiritual master. So that's the fourth canto, chapter 24, text 52. All right. So a little note about the importance of the first two cantos of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, Prabhupada has written, Everyone serious about understanding the transcendental science and seeing the transcendental form of the Lord must first of all attempt to see the lotus feet of the Lord by studying the first and second cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. When one sees the lotus feet of the Lord, all kinds of doubts and fears within the heart are vanquished. So important for us to study carefully the first two cantos. <coughs> Actually, <coughs> Prabhupada wrote the first canto before he... Before Prabhupada went to America, he had already published the first canto Srimad Bhagavatam. So at that time, he didn't really know how much time he would get and how many more books he'd be able to publish. He wasn't sure about his financial situation. He had no disciples, he had no supporters. And somehow he'd managed to publish the first canto. And so he put everything he could in there. He really filled it with a lot of nectar. Okay, so now we're going on to the second canto here. That was a quote from the fourth canto, by the way. Okay, here's a quick overview of the first canto. Recording in progress. First canto, what you covered, began with Sutta Goswami's Welcome to the Sages in the Naimisharanya forest, the first three cha chapters like that. You had questions by the sages in the first chapter, and then you have the devotional service summarized, and then in, you know, all the different incarnations in the third chapter. Then chapters four to six, you have Narada Muni instructs Srila Vyasadev. And then, Chapter 7 up to 16, we have the disappearance of Krishna and his associates. That means we have Grandfather Bhishma departed, we had Dhritarashtra departed, and then you had Lord, uh, the Pandavas, a fratricidal war, they all annihilated, all the members of the Yadu dynasty annihilated each other, and then Lord Krishna also departed from the world, and then the Pandavas retired. So that was all there in chapter 7 up to 16. And then at the end of the first canto, you have the meeting of Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami, right? With the appearance of Maharaj Parikshit, the curse of Maharaj Parikshit. And then he meets with uh, Sukadeva Goswami. So that was the first canto, and then this, now we're into the second canto, and the second canto begins with 
first uh, three steps to God realization. Chapters one, two, and three, we'll hear three steps to God realization. Or you're familiar with the, the three levels of God realization. There's the impersonal Brahman, the Paramatma, and then the Bhagavan. So they're described in the first three chapters. Then chapters four and five, questions by Pariksha, and then prayers by Sukadev. The process of creation is spoken by Brahma to Narad. And chapter 6 and 7 goes on. You have the Purusha Supta confirmed. You have Lord Brahma's realization of the universal form and Leela incarnations. Chapters 8 and 9, more questions by Maharaj Parikshit. And then the Chatur Sloki is there in the ninth chapter. And then 10th chapter, we have explanations of the Chatur Sloki. And Sukadeva Goswami will also begin the 10th chapter describing the 10 topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So that's a quick overview of the second canto. And we're on the first chapter tonight, the first step in God realization. And the chapter begins with some very powerful preaching from Shukadeva Goswami. He's stressing about the, the best use of human life. It's very, very uh, powerful speaking. And then chapter goes on into Bhakti Mishra Yoga. And Sukadeva Goswami will introduce contemplating the universal form. Then chapter 2 is about more about Paramatma, the Lord in the heart, detachment, meditation on the super soul, achieving the sum destination, and attraction for Krishna. Then chapter 3, pure devotional service, the change in heart. Krishna is the ultimate object of worship and Sonakarishi's eagerness for hearing Krishna Kata. All right, so we're going back. Oh, chapter four. <laughs> okay, more questions like that, cause of cause, yeah. This, these are the main topics. Okay, we'll be covering those in, in time. Let's go back. The connection between the first and second canto, we should understand. So at the end of the first canto, in chapter 19, text 24, we have Maharaj Pariksit speaking. O oh, trustworthy Brahmanas, I now ask you about my immediate duty. Please, after proper deliberation, tell me of the unalloyed duty of everyone in all circumstances, and specifically of those who are just about to die. Right? So that's the obvious connection there between the first and second canto that Maharaj Pariksit wants to know what, what is the duty of those who are just about to die? And there's another verse here. That was from 19th chapter. It was text number 24. And there's another nice verse, which is from the, ninth, the same chapter, but text 37 and 38. Maharaj Parikshit is addressing <coughs> the audience, uh, all the great sages and devotees, you are the spiritual master of great saints and devotees. I am therefore begging you to show the way of perfection for all persons and especially for one who is about to die. Please let me know what a man should hear, chant, remember and worship and also what he should not do. Please explain all this to me. So this was Maharaj Pariksit's request to Sukadeva Goswami, which came in the, at the end there of the first canto. So the second canto begins with uh, Sukadeva Goswami glorifying the question of Maharaj Pariksit. Right? The first verse of the second canto begins like that that your questions are glorious because it's about Krishna. And the term is there, loka hitam. Loka hitam means beneficial for everyone, for the whole world. So 
Here's from Prabhupada's lecture on Srimad Bhagavatam. This was lecturing on second canto, first chapter, verses one to five, when Prabhupada was in Melbourne, 1974. So Prabhupada says, question was about Krishna and the reply is Srimad Bhagavatam, 18,000 verses. <laughs> One verse, one question, right? One question, what is the duty of one who is about to die? And the reply is Srimad Bhagavatam, 18,000 verses. And each and every verse is so important that if a serious student studies each and every verse, each verse will take at least one month to understand. Right? And there are 18,000 verses. So, for serious study of Srimad Bhagavatam, it will take 18,000 months. So, 18,000 months, meaning how many years? 1,500 years. Okay, so I hope, you, I hope we have a long life. We need to be blessed with a long life in order to understand Srimad Bhagavatam. 1,500 years. All right, so Prabhupada, um, Sukadeva Goswami Swami uses this term, loka hitam, that this question about Krishna is beneficial for the whole world, for all men. Everyone benefits. The, the, all the audience, the, the person who asks the question benefits, the person who is going to reply, who is going to give the answer, he benefits. The audience all benefit, everyone there. So this is the nature of topics of Krishna, that they are fully transcendental and they benefit the whole world. We want to understand the importance of topics of Krishna. Mm. Prabhupada, then this is from a, a Vrindavan lecture on the first verse of the second canto. Vrindavan, the same year, 1974. Prabhupada is quoted saying, Because this Bhagavata is so nice, transcendental subject matter discussed about Krishna, it is lokahitam, it should be spread all over the world. Loka does not mean your country or your society, Brahmana society, Goswami society. You can see Prabhupada speaking in Vrindavan, so it's a different audience. So Prabhupada speaking about these things. Brahmana society, Goswami society. No, Lokahitam, for the benefit of the whole world, that is Lokahitam. Not only of this world, but other worlds also. Of the whole universe, Lokahitam Ripa, my dear king, your Prashna. So this message of Srimad Bhagavatam should be spread all over the world. So this is Prabhupada preaching in Krishna Balaram Mandir in Vrindavan, telling everyone the Bhagavatam is meant for the whole world. Okay, so very nice to hear. Yeah. Here's, you can see the Ganga flowing past the Prabhupada's uh, Pushpa Samadhi there in Mayapur. The topics of Lord Krishna are so auspicious that they purify the speaker, the hearer and the inquirer. They are compared to the Ganges water which flow from the toe of Lord Krishna. Wherever the Ganges waters go, 
they purify the land and the person who bathes in them. Similarly, the topics of Krishna are so pure that wherever they are spoken, the place, the hearer, the inquirer, the speaker, and all concerned become purified. From the purport of the first verse. Actually, before that first verse, there's uh, the invocation to Srimad Bhagavatam. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So I remember one time, uh, it w I was in Dallas, in Texas, and uh, Prabhupada was giving Bhagavatam class. At that time, we had Gurukula there in Dallas, Texas, and there were a number of young children. So Prabhupada was giving Bhagavatam class, and, you know, we read Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, and then Prabhupada immediately turned to the children and he asked them, So, what is the meaning? <laughs> he immediately put the children on the spot, you know. The children were like five, six, seven, eight, like that, very young children. But Prabhupada was questioning them. He wanted to know, what is the meaning? He said, you are chanting, you have to know the meaning. <laughs> it was very interesting how Prabhupada was training all of us, the children, everyone, wanted us all to know what we were doing, what we were saying. He didn't want us just to be parrots. Okay. Devotional consciousness contrasts the consciousness of illusion. Oh, all right. So, Sukadeva Goswami begins uh, speaking there about the questions very nice, and then he immediately begins to talk about uh, different how the how there's different kinds of householders. Now there's the Grihastas and there are the Grihamedis. So, devotional consciousness contrasts the consciousness of illusion. Okay. The, the Grihamedis, they're in illusion, but the devotees, they have a different consciousness. So, we would ask you, you can look through text number two and three and four if you like, two and three particularly, and tell me some of the symptoms of Grihamedis. We will ask you, please tell me some symptoms of the Grihamedis. Give me one symptom at a time. Do you want to do it in a group work or I think we could just take it from the class, you know, you can offer. Griha Medi. Griha meaning home and Medi meaning, what's the meaning? Householder Guru Maharaj. No. Medi means jealous or envious. envious. Envy, right, envious or jealous, okay, yes. One is too much engrossed into the family uh, affairs, too much, uh, his, his own, own attraction is towards the family and the members of the family. Yes. It's only interest, okay. Is that, that, is is that wrong? Mariji, is that wrong? But they are too much engrossed into it. It's, it says that you can be engrossed in your family, but it is not that they do not think uh, to offer everything to Krishna. It is only that they are engrossed in the family affairs. Yes, right. They have no interest in what? 
in, in the, the devotional service. Right. They have no interest in spiritual life or devotional service. Okay. And so they're very attached to the uh -huh. family. Yes. Some more qualities. Yes. And uh, they are jealous of one another. Yes. Jealous of each other. Constant quarreling and fighting. The home n never peaceful. You always hear people arguing and fighting with each other. Constant arg bickering and quarreling going on. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Most of the time they pass their night in sleeping and then in the morning they try to make more money in the name of maintaining their family members. Yes. They are either engrossed in too much of sleeping or they are engrossed in making money to maintain their family. Yes. They're very eager, work very hard to make money. They will never have an, they will never think you have enough money. They always want more. And at night, yes, yes. They are uh, in sense gratification, into sense gratification, satisfying their own senses. Busy in satisfying their own senses. Yes. How, how are they satisfying their senses? Because uh, whatever they are doing, they are doing for themselves. They don't think that they have to offer it first, first to Krishna oh. and then accept it. Okay. They do acts only for their own pleasure of their own bodies. They don't offer anything for the Lord. Well, they may do. They, they, may, they may offer their food for the Lord. <laughs> But they won't distribute it to others. <laughs> if they do offer it, they offer it for them. They offer it to the Lord for themselves, for their own benefit. So they may be pious in the sense that they're religious, but their religious piety is for their own benefit, for their own sense gratification. So that is also Grihamedi. They can be religious, but for, they're religious just for material benefit, for their own gain. Yes? Any more symptoms? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, they are interested in various material subject matters, uh, like politics or science or other things, but not in self-realization. Mm, yes, right. And they have a lot of material interests, right? They have many subject matters for hearing and chanting, but they won't like to hear Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita. Hare Krishna Maharaj, they yeah. are not following any scriptural injunctions. They don't follow any scriptural injunctions. They, well, some 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 Grihamedis they may do. They may follow some injunctions. They may be pious. You know, they can be vegetarian and they can be, you know, they may not take intoxication and so on. But, so in that sense, they have some material piety. But it's material. The purpose is for their own benefit. They don't do it for Krishna. They just think, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I met one man, he, he, he regretted that he was a vegetarian. He said, I was born a vegetarian. He said, now I, I grow up and I cannot eat meat. And he said, I feel so sorry. I wish I could eat meat like other people. <laughs> so some, sometimes they're like that. They follow the regulative principles, but they don't follow them for, for the pleasure of Krishna. They, they have no sense of devotion to Krishna. And they have no sense, really, of obedience to scriptures. They just do it for their own benefit, for some material benefit. They think it for their health, for their material health. They don't care about spiritual health. They're only thinking of the body. Yes, anything else? Thank you so much. Uh, 
their consciousness is revolved around the body so their activities will always be revolved around uh, the body okay they're very much in the bodily concept of life so in the bodily concept of life they're very attached to the family members and they think the family members can protect them from all the dangers the, they think the family members will save them at the time of death they'll always be surrounded with the family <laughs> One, one devotee was telling about his, uh, his father had some disease, you know, and he was dying. And he was saying to his wife, can you do something, can you do something to save me? And his wife just looked at him and said, what can I do? <laughs> you know, she said, what can I do to help? The, her husband was pleading with her, can you do something to save me? But she, the wife at least was realistic, she understood, she said, I can't do anything. Anyway, that's a, this is a Grihamedi mentality. And often they will, they will take the, the scriptures, or they will take the concept of the Lord, and they will make him into some kind of fictitious character. They will have, or they may even write their own scriptures. Sometimes they do like that. They, present their own scriptures, their own interpretations of the Bhagavad Gita and so on. They do things like this. So there are many different symptoms of the Grihamedis. They're very busy working to get mu as much money as they can in the daytime and at night the sexual attachment is very strong. They want to enjoy the body so there's a lot of demand for the sexual pleasures. So text 2 to 4, Sukadev starts his answer by explaining what we should not do. Hmm. We shouldn't. Do. We shouldn't waste our precious human life. That's important. The human life is rarely achieved, right? 88,400,000 species and we're only 400,000 species. So we're very, human life is very rare. It's a great fortune and it's even more rare to have association with devotees. So we should value this life. We shouldn't waste our time hearing mundane topics. That's very bad for us also. We, we can waste a lot of time just hearing nonsense things. Running after money the whole day is also condemned. Everyone needs some money, but, you know, everyone gets according to our karma. And just by working hard doesn't mean you make more money. And then sleeping or having sex the whole night, that's also not the way taking shelter of fallible soldiers, we spoke about that, the family members, the servants, and so on, the relatives, <laughs> the fallible soldiers. Okay, here we can see a nice couple with the young child, they're very happy. So, <clears throat> you have to be careful because we, we may be blind about these things. We've shown here, this is Prabhupada's lecture on Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, second canto, first chapter, second, second verse, is it, or was it? No, fifth verse. This is from Boston, 1969. So Prabhupada said, they are blind. They are thinking that these things will give him protection. Pramata. Pramata means crazy, crazy, by craziness, he is thinking, he is thinking that these things will give me protection. These things, meaning what? What, does, what things will give me protection? Someone? Family, friends, relatives. 
Okay, yes. Ma material opulences. Material opulences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And wealth. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> Here's the soldiers. We say fallible soldiers. It's all poor people in the desert there, my goodness. They have to be in those kind of lectures on the mission, the important mission of human life. Prabhupada describes how he spent the whole day for reading this newspaper or some fiction or some novels for this and that, but they have no Bhagavad Gita. Apashyatam Atma Tattvam, because they have no interest in self-realization, no interest. But don't you be mutant? This is the position. Therefore, this Krishna consciousness movement is essential at the present moment. This is Prabhupada again in Vrindavan, 1974. All right, so the chapter continues. Uh, Sukadeva Goswami is preaching. What everyone should do, we heard, he told us what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't be what? We shouldn't be Graham Medes. We shouldn't be uh, surrounding ourselves with fallible soldiers. We have to be cautious. We have to be conscious. So, Sukadeva, what we should do, we should hear and chant this activity of liberated souls. Sukadeva Goswami describes activities of liberated souls. Who does he give us an example of a liberated soul? Anyone? Have you read the chapter? Did you look over the chapter? Sukadeva Goswami speaks about liberated souls, how they're attracted to hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. And he gives an example. Maharaj, is it, uh, does he give uh, him as an example? Yes. Because right. he gives him, yes, he gives yeah. himself as an example, right? We'll put here on the slide, you can see text 8 and 9. Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna was talking about uh, how a, a person, uh, the, the great souls, uh, they will have to do any duty. And Lord Krishna gives himself as an example. He gave Maharaj Sukadeva Goswami, he's giving himself as an example. He said he was also attracted to hear the glories of the Lord. Who did Sukadeva Goswami hear from? Yes, he heard from Srila Vyasadeva. Yes, Srila Vyasadeva was his guru, he was also his father. Then, qualifications for and benefits from hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam. Qualification, you know, there, it's important to understand qualification for hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Not everyone is ready. Not everyone's prepared. There's certain qualifications required. So Sukadeva Goswami wants to encourage, tells him about the way of success. Ash, who is that? Fortune of Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Pariksha is fortunate. Why is Maharaj Pariksha fortunate? Anyone know? Yes, Maharaj. We could hear the Srimad Bhagavatam from the great elevated souls like uh, Srila Sukadeva Goswami. And uh, they enter to, to get delivered. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Because he was protected by the Supreme Lord when he was in the womb of his mother. Yes. And Sukadeva Goswami may be worried that Maharaj Parikshit may be thinking, I don't have much time 
I don't have much time because only seven days to, before, my, before the curse, I'm going to be bitten by the snake bird after seven days. So I just have seven days. So it's a bit of a rush. You know, seven days, my goodness. We take so long to do Bhakti Shastri and Bhakti Vaibhav. So Gadeva Goswami has got to preach to Maharaj Parikshit and they've got to do the whole Srimad Bhagavatam in seven days. That's really the crash course, right? But Sukadeva Goswami gives an example. What example does he give? Maharaj Katvanga. Katvanga. Katvanga, yes, right, Katvanga. That Maharaj Katvanga had only one moment, but he got success. And one moment he got success. So Sukadeva Goswami, by telling about Maharaj Katvanga, He's encouraging Maharaj Parikshit that you've got seven days, don't worry. Maharaj Gatvanga only had a moment, but he got success. Yes? So, this, we want uh, to hear from you. What do you think are the qualifications? What qualification do we need to be a good hearer? What's required? Hare Krishna Maharaj, we should have strong faith in Krishna. Well, certainly if you have strong faith, then it will help, be a help. But what if someone doesn't have strong faith? We should submissively listen to our spiritual master. Mm -hmm. We may not have a spiritual master. Or to, um, to a pure devotee. Now when Sukadeva Goswami came there, uh, when Maharaj Parikshit came there, he didn't have a spiritual master, but Sukadeva Goswami came and so he took that as a blessing, the, the arrangement of Krishna, that Krishna had sent someone who was also a devotee of Krishna. Now, why did Maharaj Parikshit particularly want a devotee of Krishna to preach to him? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. We should uh, totally surrender. We should totally surrender to the, the Supreme Personality. And then I think this is a, a, a good qualification for ideal era. Should well, totally surrender to him. Well, I think if you've totally surrendered, you know, probably, you, you you know, you don't, you don't need to hear. <laughs> You're already totally surrendered. Yeah. Uh, well, you, uh, you're, already, is, you're already, you're already perfect. One should be inquisitive. Huh? One should be inquisitive and submissive. Yes, we should be inquisitive. Yes. And what did you, uh, have, I, what, what else did you say? Inquisitive and? Submissive. Submissive. Yes. Okay, submissive, yes. We, we Hare Krishna Maharaj, we have to first find out the uh, authorized source or uh, speaker to hear from authorized and uh, we can put the trust. Then we can become an ideal hearer. Uh, so, the, yeah, you, you want to find the, the qualified speaker, right? Yes, yes. But what's the qualification for the disciple or the hearer? You know, teach, teacher may be qualified, but the hearer may not be qualified. Thank you, Maharaj. We should have, we should have a desire, Maharaj, intense desire to hear the topics of the, of the Lord. Yes, that's nice. We need that desire. How will we get that desire? Uh, the person should have, be sincere and should be eager to hear the topics of Lord Krishna. Yes, he should be eager to Maharaj, hear. Yes, he, sh he shouldn't be a hearer for the sake of hearing, but hearer for the sake of, uh, but for the purpose of uh, being corrected uh, and uh, abiding by what's being uh, told to him. 
Yes, he shouldn't just be like coming to here and then not applying anything. He should actually want to use the knowledge which he's going to receive, right? You mean like that? That he's going yes, to, he's actually going to apply what he's hearing. Uh huh. To give full attention and respect while hearing ah. the Yes, he has to give proper respect and attention. That's important. Just like Bhagavad Gita says, Tadvidi Pranipatena, right? So we have to fall down. We have to give proper respect in the beginning. So an ideal hearer, he has to be respectful. He has to be willing to hear very carefully and very attentively. But he shouldn't be challenging also. Right, he should not be challenging. Prabhupada mentions that in Bhagavad Gita. He should also. hear with full humility. Okay, hear with humility. He should be sincere and serious, Maharaj. Should be what? Sincere and serious. Serious and hearing. Serious and sincere. Okay, should be. Hare Krishna Maharaj, if the ideal hearer can understand that Srimad Bhagavatam is the book form of the Supreme Lord, it's non different from the Lord, from the Supreme Lord. Okay. Then that would be the right qualification. Could be the one. I should understand the importance of the scripture, the, 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 the scriptures being presented. Yes. Yes. Ideally, he should not have material, he should not come with material desires, right? He should be materially exhausted. He should be tired of the trying to enjoy the material world. He should be ready to give up the attempts to enjoy the material world independently of Krishna. And it's important for us to understand that just as the teacher or the speaker has to be qualified, so the hearer also has to be properly qualified. And if the hearer is holding on to material attachments, then it will be very difficult to actually penetrate the heart of the hearer. You know, sometimes we go in here, but within our heart we still maintain a lot of material desires and attachments, and we have no intentions of giving them up. That's a problem. If we go to here, but at the same time we're very attached to holding on to our own conceptions of life, then it makes it very difficult for us to get the real benefit of hearing from the pure devotee. Okay, so some of the qualifications of the of the the odd of the hearer or, or the speaker anyway were mentioned in the first chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam. The qualification of someone like uh, Sutta Goswami, that he was well qualified, that he'd studied the scriptures under the authorized person and he'd realized everything and he was fully versed in all the different darshans, the, di the different philosophical systems, he knew them all and he was not only in good knowledge but he was also a very good character, he's an ideal character, that's also important. Just like an ideal hearer, he should also be of good character. He should be <clears throat> he should be of good character. He should his mind should be peaceful and controlled. Then he can properly hear. If someone's of loose character, then it will be very difficult for him to hear. All right, so these are some points.
Maharaj, um, I have a question. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, if you can just uh, shed some light on the ideal character of uh, Professor Luce, so, so that it's still clear from... Sorry? He, he said he should be of an ideal character. Yes. So what does an ideal character comprise of? Well, like as, as we know, you know, no, no bad habits. He's not a womanizer, he's not a drunkard. I like that, he's a, he has some control over his mind and senses. Okay, thank you, thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, you also mentioned that um, why did Parikshit Maharaj, you asked this question, why did Parikshit Maharaj want to hear from Sukhdev Goswami? Yes. So the answer is it that because he knew that he's a bona fide. No, the answer, the answer was actually that Sukadeva Goswami is a devotee of Krishna and Maharaj Parikshit, he is also from a family of devotees. That Maharaj Parikshit is the grandson of Arjuna and Arjuna was a very intimate friend of Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna was always very kind to the Pandavas. So the Pandavas, of course, they were great, dev great devotees of Lord Krishna. And Maharaj Parikshit, because he's, his grandparents, uh, the Pandavas, they were all great devotees. Maharaj Parikshit is also inclined to Krishna. And Sukadeva Goswami, being the son, the son of Vyas, he's also a devotee of Krishna. Because Vyas is he's glorified Krishna. So when the two meet, they have something in common, that they're both from the devotee family. Thank so, you, Maharaj. So, it's, Thank you so it's, much. it's very nice for uh, Maharaj Parikshit to hear from Shukadeva Goswami. Although they have actually materially they have nothing in common, because Sukadeva Goswami, he's a... Uh, fully, uh, he's uh, avadut, you know, he's going around not even covered, covering his body and uh, he looks like a wild man almost, but he's actually, he's avadut, he's above the Varnashram. And Maharaj Parikshit, he's a Kshatriya from the royal family. So they have really nothing in common. Sukadeva Goswami was born from Vyasa, the son of Vyas, so he was brought up in the ashram and the countryside in the remote place and Maharaj Pariksit from the royal family with the Pandavas and brought up in opulence. But uh, now the two have met because Maharaj Parikshit had to he gave up everything. As soon as he was cursed, he understood he has to give up everything. He renounced all his material position, all his material wealth. He gave up the throne and everything, and he's preparing for death. So this is a very good qualification of a hearer. He gave up all his attachments. Just like if we have to give class, and people sit there with their hand phones, with their mobile phones in their hand. It won't be much of a class because you, you're, people are sitting with their hand phones, they're looking at their phone and they're thinking, oh, what about that call? Oh, I didn't get that call. Oh, here's this call coming. Oh, I have to get this. You know, the attention is somewhere else. So the ideal hearer, their concentration will be focused. It won't be on the mobile phone and they won't be on the watch. They won't be looking what time is it, how long is he going to talk, when is it going to be finished, <laughs> right? So ideal hearer, he'd be focused, he just wants to hear. He's not worried about the time and he's not distracted, nothing there distracting him. Is it clear? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? 
Okay, we'll go ahead. Hari Nam Anukirtanam. Srila Sridhar Swami comments that no other method of self-realization can be more beneficial than this. Then what? What's what's going to be ultimately beneficial? The chanting, the chanting of the holy name. Jiva Goswami adds a condition: one must avoid nam aparad in order to achieve the ultimate result of chanting. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains that among the angas of bhakti, hearing, chanting and remembering are the three chief ones. This has been stated in verse 5. Among these, among these three, chanting is the chief. And such chanting should be anukirtana, constant following in the footsteps of previous authorities and according to the level of one's realization. So those are some points about the chanting of the holy name. Avoid aparat and try to hear, then remembrance comes about. Chanting should be anukirtana, constant, and Prabhupada writes, should be loud, loud chanting, more powerful. Okay, question for you. Partners, how many people do we have in the class? How many? How many? How many? 37 Maharaj. Oh, a big class, yeah, 37. Okay, can we make partners? Could we, did, could you have a, make groups? That would be about, what, 19 groups or something? Or 18? One group of three? Discuss with a partner how to proactively counteract offenses to the holy name. Defenses against Nam Aparat. How are you going to counteract offences to the Holy Name? Write down the main ideas for sharing them with the rest of the class. All right? How many minutes do you need? Five minutes? Okay, five minutes. Yes? Somebody would that we would have to create breakout rooms for us to do that. Uh, yes, Maharaj, uh, uh, I'm uh, creating uh, breakout rooms. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Is Dhruv there? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Is there only two of us here in the group? Only you and I? Yes Maharaj, I'm surprised I was put in a group with <laughs> you. But uh, my your mercy. Okay. So, do you chant regularly? Yes, Maharaj. How many rounds? I'm doing 16 rounds, Maharaj. Really? Oh, good. You working? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. I don't know if you remember, Maharaj. We met you, uh, I met you in Mayapur as well as in China when we had traveled. 
uh, yeah, uh, you were doing program in the temple in Hong Kong there. So and we met you there. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yes. <laughs> it's been a while. That was long time back. But yeah, it's a long time ago, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so you're working now, huh? Yes, ma'am. In Dubai? In Dubai, yes, ma'am. Mm. I've always been here. Most, I've grown up here. Okay. So. Are you studying part-time? Uh. Oh, what happened? Oh. Hare Krishna. Recording in okay. progress. Group number? I'll, 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 I'll send you to the group 13, yeah? Yeah. Okay, everyone's back. Maraj, another, uh, another two minutes, Maraj. Okay, another two minutes, right?
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Sorry, I was transferred by the admin to the other group. Yeah. So <laughs> while the while you were saying something. Oh yeah. <laughs> I wondered what happened. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have control over that. <laughs> Anyway, nice to see you here. Thank you, Maharaj. Have you been studying all the way through? You did the whole first canto? Yes, Maharaj. Most of it. <laughs> Maharaj, everyone is back. Okay, everyone's back. So, we'd like to hear some response from the, the devotees. Uh, who would like to tell us what you discussed? Yes? Some volunteer? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh-huh. Uh, Maharaj, we discussed that, uh, you know, when we serve the Vaishnavas, then this is one of the ways to counteract Nama Prad. And also, before we start chanting, we have to prepare our consciousness by absorbing ourselves. Like if we can hear a lecture or maybe we can read so that way uh, you know when we are chanting mind will uh, we can bring our mind back to uh, hearing the chanting and also I feel um, if we put up pictures uh, on the wall or if you look at the pictures so that also helps us to uh, concentrate on the chanting and another thing I feel is uh, when one of the Srila Prabhupada's disciples asked, uh, told Srila Prabhupada that he couldn't, uh, uh, you know, his mind wanders. The Prabhupada said, what is the problem? You just have to listen to your chanting. So I have personally also tried to imbibe that, just listen very carefully to each and every word of my chanting. So, okay. and how? How do you, but what's your secret in listen? How do you manage to get your mind to focus your mind to just hear your chanting? How do you do that? Because I see that's a difficult I thing to focus to I, fix the mind. Yes, uh, sometimes my works because I try to say it out aloud and I try to say it very clearly. Okay. Does it take you a long time to say all your rounds? How long do you take to chant one round? Marat, sometimes it does take me a long time. Sometimes I feel it doesn't. Okay. If you have time. Are you a housewife? Yes, Maharaj. So you, maybe you have more time during the day to chant? Yes, I do have during the day. Okay. All right. I, I, would, I think one point, you know, you were saying about pictures. Some people, what they like to do is to put the Maha Mantra on the wall. Have the whole Maha Mantra put in the form of a picture and put it on the wall. And then when they chant, then they can be, chant, they can be reading the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. I was my partner was Shubhangi Radhika. So we both were discussing together. And um, so the, the first point that we discussed was that how to contract these Das Naam Aparat, 10 offenses. So we read them every day. We remind us that we do not have to commit these the, uh, 10 offenses. Like we have a practice in ISKCON also, right, in the morning. Right, right. So for that, how, like Mataji also mentioned about Japa, we also discussed more about, about that, that how we can have concentrated Japa. So for that, uh, maybe I won't repeat the points that is already she has said. Uh, uh, so apart from that, what we discussed was that our timing, if our timing is good, like recommended in the Brahma Murat. Uh -huh. So that that will also help us and second point is that if we if we also chant in association yes. like you know if you are a group a group doing together the vibration the concentration is more 
it definitely helps us or we could be in front of our altar we could have tulsi maharani and if in a little low voice prabhupad chanting also side uh-huh. by side you can chant with prabhupad as well okay yes these are good yeah. points very nice yes association you, association yeah. chant with associate uh, particularly to, if you can get association with senior vaishnavas the chant with yes. them is very yeah. helpful and one more point that we noted was reading shila prabhupad's books on a regular basis which yes. will increase our faith more and also our taste more for the holy name to chant all right so yes. regularly good reading Thank you, reading we should know the philosophy then will help us to have more taste for the holy name and also one lady the mataji was mentioning about she said read before the clock before you chant japa well it's sometimes good to offer a prayer before you chant japa there's some prayers which we can chant just like you know we also say shikshastikam prayers that that can also be a nice prayer and then there's namastikam you can chant also there's different prayers which we can offer to the holy name to pray that we may chant properly or we could just simply pray our own make up our own prayers as well pray to krishna that please help me to fix my mind let me chant properly and attentively to focus on the holy name okay very good uh we have some hari krishna yes uh, maharaj we have to also understand that the holy name of the lord is not different from the lord himself so when we are uh, chanting the holy name we are calling out to the lord and asking him to engage us in his service so that the desire to engage in the service should be pure so that when we chant we are more focused on our chanting yes Yes we do want to focus on the chanting. So it's very good we want to be pure. We need to be focused on the chanting. We have to control the mind. Here you can see we mention here the inattention, the main offense, inattention. Right? When we chant the ten offenses, we at the end we we also say it is also offensive to be inattentive while chanting. In the Hari Nam Chintamani, Bhakti Vinod Thakur describes this inattention to be the seed of all the ten offenses. From inattention, the other offenses come. It's the main offense. So here, it's from Hari Nam Chintamani, Hari Das spoke to Lord Chaitanya. Inattention is counted as one of the aparad. even if one successfully overcomes all the other offenses in chanting and one is chanting continuously love of god may not come one should know that the reason for this is that one is committing the offense known as pramada or inattention this offense will block progress to prem So we won't get to prem so long as we are inattentive we have to overcome inattention the antidote to an uncontrolled mind but there is a quality to such utterances also it depends on the quality of feeling You may have read that sentence it's in the purport of the pur- of Queen Kunji's prayers which means 8th chapter takes number 26 Prabhupada is talking about the chanting of the holy name and said, there is a quality to utterances it depends on the quality of feeling and what sh- how should we chant what was Prabhupada's instruction what should be our mood in chanting Do you remember the cry of a baby to to her mother? Right. Yes. Do you have a child? Yes, yes, Maharaj. So you know what the ch- the crying of the baby is like, huh? You know what it's yes, like. Maharaj. So we should when we chant, we should have that kind of mood. That's a quality of feeling. Mm-hmm. 
effort. We have to make some, everything, there has to be some effort. Effort is the gateway from Nama Parad to Nama Bas. Right? Stages in chanting. If we can get to Nama Bas, it's very good. Unless we extend our best efforts earnestly and qualify ourselves for the Lord's mercy, it is next to impossible that we can be rescued from our fallen condition. So we have to really want mercy, we have to really want to get out. And then from Srimad Bhagavatam, revival of the dormant affection or love of Godhead does not depend on the mechanical system of hearing and chanting, but it solely and wholly depends on the causeless mercy of the Lord. When the Lord is fully satisfied with the sincere efforts of the devotee, he may endow him with his loving transcendental service. So this is the challenge we face. We have to really satisfy Krishna. And when Krishna is really satisfied with us, then he will give us the ability to chant the holy name. <laughs> and here's some more points. Physiology, the meaning the body, affects psychology. The, the body affects the mind. N notice how your mind is affected when you chant while moving your eyes around the room or you chant while closing your eyes or staring at an object, you chant while sitting calmly, you chant while moving or shaking your body, chant while sitting straight with your bead bag over your heart, chant while passionately walking around the room, you get all these different things, it's all going to affect our mind, different situations, different positions we're in, what to do. Create a favourable lifestyle for chanting the holy name. A favourable lifestyle has a lot to do with how successfully we're able to chant the holy name. It's really true. If we can get our life organised in such a way, <laughs> it can make it so much easier for us to chant the holy name. So what good habits could we incorporate in our life in order to improve our japa? One of them was already mentioned. Someone spoke about Brahma Mahurta, getting up early in the morning, waking up early in the morning before sunrise so that you could chant in the morning. It's very good. Waking up regularly, the same time every morning, so you have proper time to chant the holy name. Good habits. Maharaj, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, we can also, uh, the, the time we are dedicating to chanting, we can uh, consciously avoid any other external uh, factors like mobile phones or talking to anyone. Just uh, uh, dedicate that time to as me and Krishna time. So me and Japa time, that no one else gets to interfere in that time, unless it's really important or urgency, but until then it has to be just a very dedicated personal time to Krishna. To have that consciousness is a good habit also. And how, how do you do it? Turn off your mobile phone, is it? Yeah. That's one thing, turn off your mobile phone. And what about where do you chant? Where to chant? Uh, ideally in front of the altar or Tulsi Maharani. Okay, yes, in front of the altar, Tosi Maharani. Can we go for a walk? Um, I mean, yes, we, we do, but then it, it's not going to help having good habits because we'll be constantly distracted. Yeah, it depends where you walk. <laughs> it depends how many people are around, where you go for a walk. And the Prabhupada did like to go for a morning walk. Now, of course, he didn't do it for his japa. 
It was, the doctor told him, you should go for a walk, it would be good for your heart. So Prabhupada started going for a walk. And he'd walk fast. Maharaj, that's why the morning hours are the best to get up at the Brahma hour. And then walk in the temple room and chant. Is that what you do every day? Yeah, get up early and in my temple room only walk and chant. Okay, good, very good, yes. If, especially if you have children, you want to try to get up before the children. And then you have time yeah. to chant. Because once the children get up, the children need your time, they need your attention. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. I rather prefer to chant with my children because it gives more, uh, you know, concentration for me, you know, looking at them and then, you know, going with the bead bag and sitting before the altar along with my children. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I feel good. You can chant 16 rounds like that? Yes, but sometimes, you know, um, yes, I can continue until 16, but sometimes, you know, children will chant up to 8, and then if they're going for uh, school, and then they come back to chant the remaining set of rounds, I can do the extra rounds as well with them. But I prefer to do both my children, especially my son. Okay. Your children are saintly. They like to chant. Very good. I, I, when I spoke about children, I meant young children, very small children, who are more restless. Yeah. You know? Uh, very young children, young babies and so on like that. You know, they need the attention. And if children going off to school, you know, maybe you have to pack the la pack, pack up, uh, the prasadam for them to take to school, I don't know things to be done. But anyway, you're very fortunate if you can chant with your children. Very nice. Anybody else some good habits to improve our japa? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj. Uh, we can chant along with the audio of uh, Shri Lakshmi Prabhupada or my Guru Maharaj. So oh. that helps. Okay, you like to chant, you can, you can keep pace, yeah. keep pace with Prabhupada or your Guru Maharaj chanting, keep up with them, chant at their speed. And, and also like, uh, yeah, I write, uh, means uh, as, write Hare Krishna Mahamantra on a paper and that way not a single uh, syllable is missed. Like if you see the Hare Krishna Mahamantra and chant, so... Uh, we can chant uh, exactly. Yeah, I mentioned that that people can yeah, put a take a print, put it up on the wall, print it up on the wall, have it in big letters, then you can read it and chant. Bari Jan Prabhu mentions that also in his Japa book. Okay, well, go ahead. Maharaj, just one more point. Uh, my Guru Maharaj always says that you prepare yourself a day before. You know, like you know that you have to get up in the morning, so you have to sleep early, so you don't, uh, you're not sleepy. And if you can read something, you know, because ultimately, like we say, we have to hear, hear, hear the Maha Mantra. Then that hearing can lead to Smaranam, right? If some, not that artificially we have to focus on some leelas, but then if you have read something automatically you, while chanting also, you know, you are not just, uh, you are doing some smaranam also could come to you. So Maharaj says, my Guru Maharaj says that you prepare yourself a day before for your japa. You read something about Krishna, like Prabhupada said, read Krishna book before sleeping. Yes. And then sleeping on time because I asked my Guru Maharaj once it's so difficult to get up in the morning each day. He said, no, no, it's not difficult to get up early. It's difficult to sleep early. <laughs> so if you sleep early, then you can get up early. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay, very nice. Alighting your life with the holy name. What do you do outside of your 16 rounds that nourishes your japa? And what do you do outside 16 rounds that hinders your japa? So there's different activities. Some activities will nourish your japa and some will hinder. Yes? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Like uh, one uh, habit which we, I can develop, uh, I have developed is uh, that uh, 
writing Hare Krishna Mahamantra as many times as uh, during uh, my, uh, when I get time. So repeatedly writing Hare Krishna Mahamantra. So that will keep uh, my mind uh, like uh, fully in uh, Krishna conscious and always uh, think of uh, um, Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Okay. And each and every syllable. And that will really help me and nourish me the next day Japa also and the current day Japa. Okay, very nice. Okay, you like to write the Mahamantra down many times? Yeah, I know, I know people who do that, other people. Every new piece of paper, every new sheet of paper, they must put the Maha Mantra on the top of the page. Every new piece of paper, always the Maha Mantra goes first. Okay, uh, other things we can do. One thing, nourish your japa, sankirtan. Go for sankirtan. That will help your japa also. Hinder your japa, things that will hinder your japa, watching television, watching movies, reading newspapers, mundane talk, all these things, prajapa, will hinder your japa. Okay? Nearly Sorry, done. Maharaj, what did you mention about nourish your japa? Sorry, Maharaj. Huh? What did you mention? What did you mention for nourishing your japa? Nourishing, nourishing japa, I said sankirtan. Go for sankirtan. Okay, Har okay, Harinam yes. sankirtan. Very good for your japa. Of course, reading Srimad Bhagavatam is also good. Mm. But sankirtan, street sankirtan, very nice. And hinder your japa, all the nonsense. All right, going ahead here. Nirnitam, deciding truth. According to Srila Sukadeva Goswami, this way of attaining success is an established fact, concluded not only by him, but also by all other previous acharyas. Therefore, there is no need of further evidence. This is the purport of Text number 11, the first chapter. The, the way of attaining success is an established fact. It's an effect, it's not only for Sukadeva Goswami telling Maharaj Pariksit, but all the previous Acharyas. There's no need of further evidence. It's not like we have to, oh, are you sure this is the right way? Are you sure we have to do like this? There's no need. This is the process. Hearing and chanting the holy name is confirmed by all the acharyas. There's nothing greater. All right, one problem which comes up sometimes, blasphemy. Dealing with blasphemy. Quoting from the Markandeya Purana, Sri Goswami Ji says that one should neither blaspheme the devotee of the Lord nor indulge in hearing others who are engaged in belittling a devotee of the Lord. A devotee should try to restrict the vilifier by cutting out his tongue and being unable to do so, one should commit suicide rather than hear the blaspheming of the devotee of the Lord. This is from text number 12 of the first chapter from the purport, how to deal with blasphemy. So it happens sometimes, you know, we're you know, we're in this Kali Yuga and there are people who are not very pleasant and they often may blaspheme the devotees and they don't want to hear, they don't want to chant and they may be very critical of devotees, belittling devotees, that happens, you know, people laugh and 
try to make fun of devotees sometimes. So how to deal with this kind of blasphemy? If someone's very blasphemous, some people can be really blasphemous, really offensive. So how are we meant to deal with this? Cutting out his tongue, well, that's going to be, get, you're going to get really violent to do something like that. <laughs> to cut out someone's tongue, that's really not the activity of a devotee, is it? What about committing suicide? Well, we don't want to do that either because we need devotees. We don't want to lose our devotees. So what is the proper procedure in confronting people who are blasphemous? How should we deal with them? Does someone like to tell me? Hare Krishna Maharaj. We should uh, vacate that place itself. Oh, okay. Okay, we, we should leave the place? Yes, Maharaj. We should not hear any blasphemy also, and uh, as we cannot do any uh, physical uh, harm, so it's uh, better to leave that place. Thank you, Mr. Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, first of all, we should humbly request the, the other devotee that uh, if we can avoid this because it's not helping us or him, either of us in our spiritual life. In case the, the blaspheming devotee doesn't, uh, uh, I would say, uh, listen to us, then it's better to leave that place with all due respect, showing our, uh, showing that we are not uh, very uh, accommodating to the fact of hearing Vaishnava blasphemy. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, maybe we can, while it's being blasphemed, we can, on the other side, start glorifying the devotee and uh, bring out his good qualities to counteract the blasphemy. <laughs> yeah, you could try. <laughs> they may become more blasphemous, though. You're trying to bring out the good qualities, they may try to bring out more bad qualities. That's a problem there. Hare Krishna Maharaj, probably we can tell the person who's doing this that there are much more interesting, you know, in Krishna conscious life to talk about. And also, you know, also tell the um, magnanimity of the Lord, how Lord is accepting all of us when we all are doing a lot of mistakes and we are not able to, you know, um, pardon or, you know, we've been very little in, in looking mistakes. We can be a little bit, you know, have a broader perspective or don't show interest in all of this and are much more to focus. So maybe that we can bring out in a very, very humble way again. What, you're talking about appealing to, appealing to the blasphemer? Yes, and tell them that, you know, there are much more, you know, wonderful to talk about the pastimes of the Lord rather than indulging in little talks like this. Maybe we can give it to mm -hmm. Well... It, it, it could be challenging, could be very difficult. The problem... Yeah, uh, it is all because of the modes of the nature, only these the devotees, they behave like this. So we can pray to the Lord, at least they could, uh, they can be in a better devotee that, that we can you know, Generally, we think of the Madhyam Adhikari, the intermediate devotee and how he deals with different people, right? He offers his worship to the Supreme Lord and he will take association with the devotees, with his peers, and he will give mercy to the innocent. But for the atheistic and the blasphemer, he will avoid them. He will avoid them. He won't try to give instruction. It's not recommended to try to give instruction because they just become more offensive. If you try to, you know, try to explain something to them, 
they've just become more offensive. They're al already can be, they're, they are already blasphemous, and if they could commit more blasphemy, it may be our fault, because, you know, we, we've, in, we've encouraged them, we've agitated them even more, and they become even more offensive and blasphemous. So we have to be very careful in dealing with these kinds of people. So the Majjama Adhikari general, generally, they will simply avoid that person. They don't want to be around him. All right, and then... Maharaj, can I ask a question? Yes, okay. Maharaj, how do we... Uh, okay, uh, we understand that blasphemy is wrong, but let's, uh, if the blasphemer is a devotee who has done something wrong, and if a discussion is happening about the, what has been wrong, is that blasphemy also? Well, it, it can increase, it can become blasphemous. It can increase. If, if the person becomes more offensive, then it can be our fault. Okay, so, so ideally we should just avoid any sort of discussion which can lead to blasphemy. Right. Better just, better just to avoid. Thank you. That's the safest way. Unless one is like an Uttama Adhikari, you know, that you can convert the blasphemous person into a devotee. You know, it's, it's really difficult, you know. We're not Uttama Adhikaris, we're not quite on that level that we can convince everyone to just change their opinions about things and make them into devotees. It's not so easy. So, Prabhuji Maharaj, so is it is this understanding okay that if we think that okay, this person should meet with an Uttam Adhikari, preferably, so that that might help him, because ultimately his mental state is not good. So, or he's not he's not uh, doing fair with his life. So, if we cannot do anything then at least he or she, we should at least help him or her in meeting an Uttam Adhikari. But would that be a good approach? They may not take the help from the Uttama Adhikari. Uttama Adhikari, they see that everyone is already a devotee. One who is on the topmost level, they see everyone is already serving Krishna. Everyone is already uh, in their uh, situation. And they, they don't worry, that's why they don't preach generally, Uttama Adhikaris. They won't preach. But when, if an Uttama Adhikari is going to preach, he will come down to the Madhyam level. And to preach, he will make distinction. Um, Maharaj, in this regard, what we can do is we can pray for the devotee, right? We can pray to Krishna for that devotee. Well, the person who is blaspheming is not really a devotee, but the, if, if the blasphemer, the blasphemer is usually not a devotee. The blasphemer is some atheistic, envious person. But he's blaspheming devotees, he's criticizing devotees. But he himself is not a devotee. Generally, the people who criticize the devotees, they're, they're the materialists, and they're, or they're the atheists, and they, they blaspheme the devotees. And, but then they could be chanting 16 rounds, they could be initiated. Well, if they're blasphemy. doing that, they won't be, it's, I, usually you won't get people who are doing that, that they will be blasphemous. That's very unusual. If somebody's chanting 16 rounds and following every, and he's a, if he's initiated, he won't be, usually they won't be so blasphemous. The blasphemy usually comes from people who are not devotees. 
But it may happen, you may, it, may, it could happen, you, somebody may, somehow he's, he's developed a very critical mood, and it does happen, we get people who are very critical, even the, their devotees, and they, they, they become very critical of other devotees. So, they need, you know, if, if, if they've been devotees in the past and somehow they've become very critical, they need to get good association. Yeah, they need to actually get good association with somebody who they can respect and somebody who they can actually hear from. Now, we, we've seen that sometimes in our Krishna Consciousness Movement. Sometimes devotees were having difficulty and they were very critical. But then, you know, a very senior devotee comes by and, and he invites them, you know, come and stay with me and come and be with me. And they'll go with him and they'll spend time with him. And he can, just by being with him and hearing from him, they can be changed and they can give up their criticism and their blasphemy. It does happen. So good association can really help uh, people who are devotees. But people who are not devotees, who are blasphemous, then that's more difficult. Okay? We have to be... Maharaj? Yes? Hare uh, Maharaj, sometimes a uh, devotee may have a genuine concern or um, they may be sharing an unpleasant situation that they had with another devotee. So does that also count for blasphemy? Because they are just sharing what happened to them and they may be, uh, uh, they may have been at the receiving end of things. So they may be hurt and they're just sharing it with somebody else. So does that count for blasphemy? Well, it may do. You should be, we, we, we should be cautious. We, we should be very cautious to talk about some things like that. Rather, something happens to us, you know. It's not something which we want to go around and tell other people about, you know, this happened to me, you know what happened to me, you know. This is not really the business of devotees. What we want to talk about more is Krishna, Krishna consciousness. Talk about the Lord and His pastimes. If something may have happened to us which was not very agreeable, which was not very pleasant. But generally it's better for us to just be tolerant. And to think, I must have deserved it. You know, I must have done something in the past. Just like Prabhupada was giving a lecture and in the middle of the lecture one man stood up and he began to criticize and yell and scream at Prabhupada and then he walked out. And Prabhupada just said to the devotees, he said, I must have offended him in my previous life. So something happens to us which is not ple pleasant, we had some problem. No, okay, you know, we, we have to be tolerant and we have to understand the material worlds like this, there's always challenges. And see these things like a test from Krishna. To be Krishna conscious and to tolerate all the difficulties. You don't want to be dwelling on it, oh you know what happened to me, you know what this, what they did to me, oh and you know I suffered. That's, it's not good to talk about these things. It's not helping our, our Krishna consciousness. It's better not to talk about these things. Better to just leave it. Just accept it. But if you talk about it, then you, you get feelings about it, you get a grudge about it, why this happened and they shouldn't have done that. And, it doesn't create the right mood, you see. As devotees, we want to be very cautious about talking about these different things. It's actually prajalpa. It's not so much blasphemy, but it's more prajalpa. It's not valuable talk. Okay? 
Thank you, Maharaj. All right, we're going ahead. We have the example. Of, you know, I was I was talking about Maharaj Parikshit that he had seven days to prepare. So Sukadeva Goswami may be worried that oh, uh, he may be thinking it's not much time. So Sukad Sukadeva Goswami gave the example of Maharaj Gatvanga. The Maharaj Gatvanga had only a moment to prepare. But it was enough. It was enough time for him. Right? Who can tell me the story about Maharaj Gatvanga? Who knows? The whole story can tell. Maharaj, can I say? Okay, go ahead. So, um, the demigods uh, asked Maharaj uh, uh, Katwanga to fight uh, with them on uh, on their behalf against the uh, um, demons. And uh, he fought against them for a very long time. And uh, when it was time for him to come back to the earth, they were so pleased with him, they asked him that if they could give him any material boon. And he didn't want any material boon. He just said that, I wish to know how much longer do I have uh, to live. And they said, one moment more, which is, I think, 48 minutes uh, as per Earth's time. And uh, so he gave up everything because he knew that uh, in those 48 minutes or so, he had to um, become uh, or achieve perfection. So he dedicated himself to going back to Godhead. Okay. So Maharaj Gadvanga, I, I don't know, I never heard this 48 minutes before. This, I, I guess that's it. You'd keep one moment of heavenly time, it's 48 minutes on this planet, is it? Yes, Maharaj. I read it somewhere. Oh, really? I don't, I don't know. It's not there in the Bhagavatam. Anyway, uh, Mad Maharaj Gadvanga, he, he was already detached. That's the point, that he'd already detached himself. So it didn't take him a long time to prepare because he, he was already detached. He'd been fighting on behalf of the demigods, as Maharaji said, and so he was already mentally detached from the world. And so when he heard he had a moment, he could immediately fix his mind on the lotus feet of the Lord and he got perfection. Now if we heard we have a moment, it might be a panic for us, but he was meant he he mentally prepared himself. You could say by by the mood of service, by selfless service on behalf of the demigods, he'd be, he'd become detached. And so when he heard he had a moment's time, then it was not a problem for him to give up the body. And similar, Maharaj, uh, Sukadeva Goswami is encouraging Maharaj Parikshit that if Katvanga Maharaj could do it in a moment's time, you have seven days, so you shouldn't be a problem. You should, you should also be able to go back to Godhead. Maharaj Parikshit had also given up everything. He left everything to come and sit and hear and just simply prepare for the end of his life. And so he showed his willingness to give up everything, to leave everything behind. You see materialistic people, they're so attached, they don't want to leave everything. They, oh, oh, I can't. They, they don't want to give up anything. They want to keep everything with them. They never want to leave. But we see the example from Srimad Bhagavatam, how these great souls prepare to leave the body. Uh, Janani Vas Prabhu here in Mayapur, he will often say that uh, Srimad Bhagavatam is the art of dying. <laughs> you know, the, there's that other group, the art of living. We are the art of dying. How to prepare for death. That is Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. 
better a moment of full consciousness. And Prabhupada talks that the tree may live a long time. The trees live can hundreds of years even. But what is the value of a lifetime like a tree? He says, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in this world 48 years, Shankaracharya 32 years, but great contributions. And so better, better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion. People are attached to long life. They want to live a long time. What is the value? Markandeya Rishi lived a long time. He found it to be a trouble. All right. What is this? Oh, sorry. What happened? Okay, here we are. So, we, we, we ask you, better a moment of full consciousness than a long life of illusion? Evaluate the above statement with other scriptural evidences. Discuss the import of this statement. Anybody wants to comment further on that? Or we, can we just go ahead? I think I've covered pretty much the import of the statement. Prabhupada would quote uh, Chanakya Pandit about time. He said, you can buy time, you can buy gold, but you cannot buy time for any amount of gold. So time is more valuable than gold. Dealing with blasphemy, this is from the nectar of devotion. There are three ways of dealing with such insults. If someone is heard blaspheming by words, one should be so expert that he can defeat the opposing party by argument. If he is unable to defeat the opposing party, then the next step is that he should not just stand there meekly, but should give up his life. The third process is followed if he is unable to execute the above-mentioned two processes, and that is that one must leave the place and go away. If a devotee does not follow any of the above-mentioned three processes, he falls down from his position of devotion. So generally we, we go away. Offending devotees. Who are you offending? What is causing you to make offences or be critical of the devotees? What attitude must you adopt to stop being critical? What must you change within yourself to adopt these proper attitudes? So these are the questions we can ask yourself if we have the habit Maybe we're worried about offending devotees. Who are you offending? Are we offending the devotees? We should be conscious of that the devotees are very dear to Krishna. What is causing us to make offenses or be critical of the devotees? Why are we doing it? Maybe it's our own envy. Maybe we're jealous of their success or something. What attitude must we adopt to stop being critical? Well, we could start looking at ourselves instead of looking at others. Be critical of ourself. What must you change within yourself to adopt these proper attitudes? We have to change the false ego. We, sh we should consider it to be it's, we should think it's not our duty to be critical or to find faults with others. 
we should be critical of ourselves. The proper attitude is to think, I am very fallen. The more advanced one is, the more one will be humble and consider himself fallen. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna Das Kaviraj says, I am more sinful than Jagai and Madhai. I am lower than a worm in stool. Anyone who utters my name, they become sinful. And anyone who hears my name, they lose all their pious activities. Only the mercy of Lord Nityananda could deliver such a fallen soul as myself. And so that's Krishna Das Kaviraj. And Prabhupada says when these devotees talk like that, they actually mean it. They're not just saying it. They really mean it. So, humility. The conclusion is one should neither hear nor allow vilification of a devotee of the Lord. We should not hear and we should not allow others to criticize devotees. All right, so just to cover, to overview what we covered tonight, we've been speaking about, first of all, the connection between the first and second cantos. Someone can tell me what was the connection between the first and second canto? Yes, Prabhu? Is there a Prabhu there who can tell me the connection between the first and second canto? Dhruv. Dhruv Prabhu. Dhruv Advaya. Yes, Maharaj, was it? It was a question. Yeah, what was the question? Um, it was about uh, Sukadeva Goswami talking to Parikshit Maharaj. Yeah, yeah, yes. What was the question? What question did Parikshit have? Um, asking about uh, how we can achieve perfection. Okay. Yes, particularly, what was the special such circumstances of Maharaj Pariksha? Uh, that he has seven days, right? Yeah, he has seven days to live. So how does yeah. he get perfection in seven days? What does he have to do? What's his duty for one who is about to die? Right? And so that, that's the connection. The second canto begins discussing the duty of one who is about to die. Have we had a look at the overview of the second canto? Okay. Summarize the essence of Sukadeva Goswami's answer to Parikshit Maharaj's question. Never forget Krishna. Always remember Krishna. That's the important thing. You're about to die, you want to train your mind to remember Krishna. That's the whole point. Then Prabhupada's mood and mission, the following phrases reflect Srila Prabhupada's mission. Lokahitam, Lokahitam in the very first verse, beneficial for all men. Beneficial, not only all men, all people, all living entities, beneficial to the whole planet. What is beneficial? Maharaj Pariksha's question. The question of Maharaj Pariksha was beneficial because from that one question, the Srimad Bhagavatam became, was spoken. From one question, 18,000 slokas came. So this is beneficial for the whole planet, for all the living entities. Everyone benefits by the speaking of Srimad Bhagavatam. And that speaking of Srimad Bhagavatam came about just by Maharaj Parikshit's question. All right. And then apashyatam atma tatvam. Therefore, this Krishna consciousness movement is essential. At the present moment, apashyatam atmatatvam. The people who are blind 
to Atma Tattva. They don't want, they have, they're busy in all their maya, all their nonsense, all their prajalpa. And they're busy with the Grihamedi life. So the Krishna consciousness movement is very important. Because people are so jealous and envious of each other, not only at the family level, at the international level, the nations, they're envious of each other. War is going on between nations. One nation is envious of another nation. It's all based on this print, this because people don't want to hear the science of the soul. They're all absorbed in the body. They're all hearing the nonsense about material life. Okay, then we spoke about the Bhagavatam's description of materialistic life. We heard about the Grihamedis, their business, how they're busy working so hard. They always want to make money, more money, they have to get more money. And they'll work in the most dangerous situations and they'll go and work in the most horrible places just to get money. One, one lady I know, uh, she, she's in Russia, she told me, and, and she's a teacher actually, and she told me she took, took the job to go and work in this part of Russia where it's six months of, six months of darkness and six months of light. It's way up in the very north of Russia. It's way up like near the North Pole, you know. So it's extremely cold, <laughs> you know. And then you get six months darkness and then six months light. And so even in the daytime it's dark and pay more. The government pay more because nobody wants to go there and work. So people do these kind of jobs. Of course, th this lady, she's a devotee. And she's little, so that's nice. But other people, they have terrible jobs, you know. Some, there's a, we met this one man, bombs. Sometimes they discover bombs and his job is to go in and to defuse the bombs. And so it's very dangerous. Sometimes a bomb will go off and the man can be killed. And there was another man, his job is climbing on the buildings, big skyscraper buildings. He has to go around the building, look on the outside of the buildings and look at the cracks in the building to see if the building's falling apart. <laughs> Very dangerous. Some, some of the jobs which people have, you know, they just, they do it just for money, to get money, <laughs> even at the cost of their own life. Of course, people work horrible situations, they breathe horrible fumes just to get money. This, this is materialistic life. So Srimad Bhagavatam tells us about these people, the Grihamedis. Okay, then we spoke about how to defend oneself against Nam Aparad. How to protect yourself against Nam Aparad. Loud chanting. Wake up early in the morning. More chanting. Chant in good association, go to temple room, try to chant these things and hear also the philosophy and before chanting offer prayers to help us to chant nicely, have a prayerful mood, chant like a child separated from the mother, all of these things. Plan how to create a favourable lifestyle for chanting. Yeah, we covered that. Favorable lifestyle for chanting. Put down your mobile phone, turn off your mobile phone. Keep all the d things to distract you out of the way. You don't want to try to chant around wh where you've got a lot of things cluttering ar around. Try to get in a nice empty place. Sometimes it's good even to go out to the park and just chant, chant in the forest with the trees or something. Identify the qualities of an ideal hearer of Bhagavatam. The qualities, they'll be very 
focused on hearing. When they come to Bhagavatam, they're not tired. They're not going to go to sleep. They're not tired. They're very careful and they're, they're, very, they're very attentive. They're very focused. They're not thinking about the business or about the, the you know, the, 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 the sports or the cricket match or anything. They're focused. They want to hear Bhagavatam. Their real business is to hear Bhagavatam. And then we spoke about the example of Sukadeva Goswami as an impersonalist. He was attracted by the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. And because he heard, because he heard the pastimes of the Lord, he became a devotee, even though he was an impersonalist. He was attracted because the, the topics of Krishna are so attractive that even someone who's on the platform of Brahma Jyoti, they can be attracted to hear about Krishna. Oh, this was also mentioned from the Atmarama Sloka. It's also there in the lifestyle of Sukadeva Goswami and the four Kumaras, how they were attracted. And then the application of the guidelines for dealing with blasphemy in a contemporary context. <clears throat> so it may be good association, very, the very best association with senior devotees can help, or it may just be simply keep away and don't try to agitate things more. Don't disturb, don't give the person more opportunity to blaspheme. Okay. Maharaj, I have a question. Yes. Uh, it's mentioned that Shukadev was an impersonalist and he was attracted by the transcendental pastimes of the Lord that he became a devotee. Yes. So, how do we understand that he was an impersonalist? Because I think there is a backstory to his. Uh, uh, you know, before he took birth, uh, he heard it from, I think, uh, uh, he was a parrot and he heard this conversation between Lord Priva and Parvati, who was reciting the Bhagavatam and, uh, you know, and he was there. So there's this whole story. So if he heard the Bhagavatam, how could he have been an impersonalist? Well, you know, that story which you're talking about, that's a Puranic story. It's not, we don't see that in Prabhupada's writing anywhere, the story about the parrot and stuff. It is there, it's a Puranic pastime, but uh, generally, that Sukadeva Goswami was an impersonalist, it mean he was fixed on the platform of Brahman. And it's a leela which shows us the power of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. The important point is that by hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, the impersonalist or someone on the platform of the Brahma, Brahman, like Sukadeva Goswami, can be attracted and become devotee. It's to show us the power of the Srimad Bhagavatam that it can change the Brahmagyani into a devotee. All right. Are there any other questions? Any other questions, anybody? No? Then we will finish here tonight and we will be back on Thursday. And we'll continue with the first chapter and we'll go through the first chapter on Thursday. All right, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Thank you, Maharaj. Go back to Vrinda ki jai.